warm welcome uh, to our latest Africa Center webinar um, and to all the alumni who are joining us from around the globe for this webinar, Bolstering Civilian Oversight of the Security Sector, Practitioner Perspectives. I am Dr. Katherine Lena Kelly. I'm the Associate Dean and the Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. And I'm pleased to be opening and moderating this webinar which is the latest of those that we've convened on rule of law, security sector governance, and related topics that are at the forefront of the minds of all of those who are involved in analyzing and or delivering security to citizens on the African continent and beyond. You can find more information on the Africa Center's work on these issues of security sector governance and other African security issues on our website, um, under the programs tab. And I think links to our website will be in the chat for all who would like to follow them. Before we introduce the objectives for today and start our discussion, let me turn it over to our director, Ms. Amanda Dory. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, and good day. Bonjour, bon dia, assalamu alaikum, siku in Zuri, dumela, sani bonani, that's all I have. I'm still working on my greetings in as many languages as possible, but it's a pleasure to greet you today from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies here on the campus of the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. My name is Amanda Dory, and it's my honor to serve as the director of the Africa Center. I'm very pleased to greet so many alumni and partners from all over Africa and beyond. As most of you already know, the Africa Center was chartered by the US Congress 25 years ago, and we conduct academic programs and research related to the full range of security challenges in Africa. The vision that we're working towards is security for all Africans, championed by effective institutions that are accountable to all of their citizens. And our topic today has generated a tremendous amount of enthusiasm in fact, we have had the greatest number of registered participants ever for a webinar who have signed up to join us today. So clearly, issues related to governance of the security sector are not only timeless in their importance, but concerns about civil military relations, roles and responsibilities are acute in the current moment where insecurity is mounting in every region of the globe and governments and security forces are under immense pressure to deliver security and other public goods to their populations. Our program today is conducted in support of this vision of citizen security and using our typical methodology of dialogue, peer learning, and seeking to catalyze strategic solutions. Based on the strong interest in today's topic, we're trying something new today. We've added discussion groups at the end of the panel presentation in order to allow for more voices to be heard and more dialogue than is possible using Zoom's chat feature in the question and answer format. So we hope many of you will want and be able to stay for that. Before I turn you back over to Dr. Kat Kelly, just to remind again, our website continues to publish the latest research at www africacenter.org. Two uh, recent publications may be of particular interest given today's topic. One is by the Commandant of Malawi's Defense College, Brigadier General and Professor Dan Kowali, uh, who has written a piece on oversight and accountability to improve security sector governance. And a second one is a shorter infographic that was authored by Africa Center, looking at term limit evasions and coups in Africa as two sides of the same coin. And this was released earlier this week. So finally, um, before turning it back over to mention, we also this week launched a newsletter for Africa Center alumni in three languages, and would love to hear your feedback on it and any updates that you would care to share with us. So with that, let me welcome you again and turn it back over to Dr. Kelly to proceed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, so today uh, to kick off this webinar, uh, we had um, 
several objectives to propose, and we hope um, in, um, in terms of the illustrious speakers we have, um, we will um, achieve some of these objectives um, first through the moderated discussion and the Q&A over Zoom, but then as the director said, also in the open discussion sessions that will follow in um, single language groups. So the objectives today, um, we hope the webinar will help us as a group discuss the strengths and weaknesses of security sector oversight institutions, everything from police oversight boards and parliamentary committees to independent commissions to counter corruption or protect human rights. We hope to analyze some of the opportunities and threats that security sector oversight institutions and the leaders who are implementing the oversight process have encountered in different African country contexts, as well as strategic ways to respond. And we, of course, um, through this event, hope to continue to provide a forum for African experts to share knowledge and experiences on the importance of rule of law for senior and emerging leaders who are involved in these oversight processes. All right, to begin the webinar, let me ask our panelists to turn on their cameras and I will introduce um, our lineup of speakers today. We're so lucky to have with us. We have with us, Mr. Sean Tate. He's the executive director of the African Police Civ Policing Civilian Oversight Forum or APCOF. This is a non-governmental organization working on issues of police governance and accountability in Africa. He's also a board member of the African Security Sector Network and of the Afro-Asian Association for Justice Development. He is also an expert member of the African Union Steering Committee on Security Sector Reform, so certainly a consummate expert on the issues we want to speak about today together. Under his stewardship of APCOF, he has worked with, among others, the AU Department of Peace and Security, the Pan-African Parliament, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, and um, EAPCO, the East African Police Chiefs Cooperation Organization, SARPCO, which is the Southern African Police Chiefs Organization, and many other institutions, notably the South African Independent Police Investigative Directorate, the Kenyan Independent Policing Oversight Authority, the Nigeria Police Service Commission, and the list goes on. Um, so he brings a great deal of experience in this domain for us uh, to learn from and um, to ask him questions about today. So welcome, Sean. Uh, we also have with us Mr. Abdul Tejan Kol. He is a human rights lawyer, an activist, and an expert in the fields of international criminal justice, human rights, governance, anti-corruption, and environmental law. He has this really rich and diverse background, so we're very lucky to have him. He has over 30 years of um, dedicated work in progressive development of human rights, good governance, and post-conflict reconstruction. Um, he's been a lecturer in law at University of Sierra Leone. He has also held quite a few prominent positions, including he is a former commissioner of Sierra Leone's Anti-Corruption Commission, uh, focusing on high-level corruption cases and combating corruption in critical sectors. He has worked as deputy director at the International Center for Transitional Justice in Cape Town. He has been executive director of the Open Society Initiative for West Africa, and also an attorney at the Special Court for Sierra Leone, in addition to executive director of the African Studies Association. So um, welcome, Abdul. Uh, welcome, Sean. And I think we're ready to begin the discussion. I will start by posing the first question to Abdul. And Abdul, if you could give us a general answer in uh, seven minutes or so, um, despite um, how large these questions may, may be and how, how we could probably do a webinar in each of them. <laughs> could you start by speaking to us about why are independent commissions, whether set up to do anti-corruption or to protect human rights of citizens, why are these commissions important and potentially useful organizations for reinforcing civilian oversight of the security sector. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, bonjour à tous, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, my greetings from my end. Um, let me um, say, um, Catherine, um, let me thank you first of all for the invite and to be part of the panel. But, um, I want to draw from my experience in the Sierra Leone context, and as I always start with a sort of a proviso that my context might not necessarily be the same 
there's no one size fits um, solution. But in the context of um, Sierra Leone and in the countries that I've worked in within Africa, I think um, independent anti-corruption commissions, independent human rights commissions, and I put a lot of emphasis on the word independent. When they're independent, I believe they play a very crucial role in um, reinforcing civilian oversight of the security sector and ensuring um, accountability of the security sector. Um, uh, they contribute not only to the immediate issues, but I think they also play a critical role in building transparent, accountable, and trustworthy uh, um, security sector, as well as fostering um, public confidence and trust in law enforcement. So let me start off with the whole question of accountability, because I think accountability is really, accountability and oversight mechanisms are really the bedrock of democratic societies and they are crucial for um, enhancing the, the rule of law. Um, nobody is above the law and nobody should be above the law. The police, the army, the police needs to be policed and the, the army itself needs to be policed. So they need to be made accountable to the communities and the people they serve. There is the, 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 the famous um, quote, I think, by the British historian, Lord Acton, about power tends to corrupt and absolute power um, corrupts um, absolutely. Here, what independent anti-corruption commissions, what independent human rights commissions seek to do is to hold accountable the security sector institutions to make sure that they account to the community, the people they serve and the people that they, 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 they work for. So I think by having independent um, um, uh, institutions um, carry out this work, this work, I think it's, first of all, brings credibility in the eyes of the public. Um, I think the, the people see um, when in these in institutions are independent, the people trust them more, the people tend to rely more on them. And then, of course, there is a general sense of um, the famous um, blue wall of silence that there's a uh, um, the spirit to call between the in, with particularly within the police, for example, as an example, let me use the police as an example. When they are investigating offenses, when they're investigating themselves, there is a tendency or there's a belief, a perception out there in the public that they 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 work together or they they protect each other or they they look at each other's back. And having independent institutions look at that, look at investigate them or work with them or engage them, I think that helps a lot in ensuring that the public sees that whatever is being done is credible and whatever is being done is um 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 is not affected by this wall of silence, by this perceived wall of, wall of silence. So when these institutions are independent. They, um, they have procedures that are also much more accessible to the public than many of these security sector institutions. People in our parts of the world tend to fear to engage um, security sector institutions directly. And so when it's being done by independent institutions, um, um, civilian run institutions, they tend to be much more accessible to the people and the people tend to want to engage them and, and, and feel um, um, that they can easily engage um, one of their own as opposed to um, um, going directly to the security sector. I want to talk about a specific instance in my case during my time as anti-corruption commission and the work that um, sort of I did with the um, Independent Police Complaints Board in Sierra Leone. The Independent Police Complaints Board is a, a civilian oversight body that was set up um, by law um, uh, based on the, um, the, police, the, 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 the Police Complaints Board regulations of 2013. And, um, it had been there for quite a while, but it was sort of formalized and sort of set up um, um, and formalized and set up in 2013 based on the regulations. But the, the, what this body does is provide civilian oversight. It helps build public trust in the police. And um, one of the key things that, the bod that this body has done has been to sign MOUs with the Anti-Corruption Commission and with the Human Rights Commission. Not that because they're independent, but because they are linked with the police and because they seem to have a close connection with the police, they've signed memorandums of association, mem memorandums of understanding with the a ACC and the, the Human Rights Commission so that whenever they have cases of corruption, they do not do the investigation themselves. They tend to refer those investigations to the Independent um, um, Anti-Corruption Commission or the Independent Human Rights Commission so that they can do the investigation. And this has worked wonders. In fact, even when they do investigations themselves, they do bring in people from the Anti-Corruption Commission when it pertains to corruption cases or in uh, the Human Rights Commission when it pertains to um, um, human rights cases. This has helped in a, way, in a very significant way, in my view, to strengthen 
um, um, the um, the whole question of people seeing them, the perception of people seeing them as upholding integrity, it has um, helped provide independent oversight of the, the, the institutions. It has helped them investigate and be much more seen, as per, the perception again from the public as being seen as independent of, of the police, being independent of the government, being seen independent of the, um, 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 the, the, the executive. It has helped them really um, create that, build that public trust. And one of the things they've done is that they've also gone beyond just investigating cases. The, the, the IPCB in Sierra Leone has a, a, a perfect, a good record in terms of coming up with independent um, um, reports and independent analysis, but it has also gone beyond just investigating cases to recommend reform. So it has worked with the ACC, it has worked with the Human Rights Commission to come up with recommendations as to how police can use force, how um, the whole question of corruption within the police force can be dealt with. It does, it's not a perfect institution, it does have its limitations, but I think it has gone a significant way in terms of helping to address um, whatever mistrust, helping to put in place checks and balances and helping to build public trust and confidence in the security in, uh, um, institution. So I think these institutions, when they are independent, they play a key role in ensuring that um, the security sector institutions are um, um, play their part and, and are held accountable to the people. Great, thank you. Thank you so much already for a very illustrative example that seems to have um, quite a bit of um, useful, um, uh, it seems to be quite a useful example, I think for us to um, move forward with thinking about, though, as you point out, um, each context is different. So figuring out quite the right things to do um, across contexts will um, require people who are immersed in their own um, particular setting trying to address some of these issues. So speaking of a particular context, uh, including um, what you started sharing, Abdul, let me pose a second question to you um, that's a bit more specific. So when you were the head of Sierra Leone's Anti-Corruption Commission from 2007 to 2010, could you talk a bit about what you learned about the unique opportunities as well as the constraints that leaders of oversight institutions may have if they're seeking to make an impact on citizens' security and justice outcomes or their trust in the state? Oh, sure, definitely. Um, and I think in my case, um, there were several um, um, unique opportunities that I had that um, um, with hindsight, I took advantage of some, but <laughs> on reflection, um, I probably could have done better in terms of others. But um, one of the first things that for me, one of the key opportunities was um, at the time that I took up office, the Anti-Corruption Commission had a very weak legislation. We had a very weak law. And um, the president then who was, um, who had just won an election um, um, largely based on, a, largely on a campaign based on an anti-corruption, on to fight anti-corruption vigorously, was very keen and very eager to um, bring about change and to see change. So I realized that there was an opportunity to strengthen the anti-corruption law. The old anti-corruption act had been passed largely not because in my humble view of a commitment to fight corruption, but more about ticking a box from a donor. And they wanted to get funding from a donor, a particular donor. The donor insisted that they have an anti-corruption act. They passed a law which was very weak, very wishy-washy in my view. And I saw an opportunity here to push for a stronger and a, a, a tougher piece of legislation because in the past, the Anti-Corruption Commission had constantly uh, made reference to the fact that its law was weak and the public civil society had also con 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 um, criticized the commission for being unable to take certain actions because it didn't have the, the necessary legislative mandate. So I saw an opportunity to um, bring about a change in the law. And so I took advantage of it. So um, I, I think I joked when we last met in Banjul that um, when politicians are new in office, it's the best time to take advantage of it. It's um, the best time to move because the longer they stay in office, the more, the more difficult it is to bring about um, certain changes. So within the first six months of um, President um, Koroma's tenure and um, my tenure in the ACC, we walked um, very vigorously, we built on a platform which was already there because there was already some conversation within the commission about changing the law. So we built on that platform and we moved very speedily to draft and to submit um, to the executive and to lobby parliament 
to pass a very strong um, anti-corruption act, the Anti-Corruption Act of 2008, which um, I honestly believe is a very, very strong and one of the strongest laws we have within the continent. Um, um, it was a law that we didn't sort of cut and paste from other jurisdictions, but we looked at our own specific circumstances and our own specific um, situations in Sierra Leone. And one of the key aspects of that law and the amendment that was done to the constitution subsequently was to transfer prosecutorial power from the office of the attorney general and the minister of justice to the commission of the anti-corruption commission. Um, the attorney general and minister of justice in Sierra Leone is a, uh, and a member of the executive, he sits within cabinet. And there was a perception then that the attorney general and minister of justice sided and favored his own colleagues and did not um, was not independent in terms of prosecution. There were cases which the anti-corruption commission said it forwarded to the attorney general and minister of justice that were not prosecuted. And uh, so we felt that it was really important to give the commission itself prosecutorial powers. And so one of the key changes we made with the new law and with the support of the president, a new president who I said was still committed to his manifesto and committed to his mandate, was to transfer prosecutorial powers to the commission. And that helped significantly, at least during my tenure, during the time I was there, because we were not only able to um, prosecute some more senior ministers of government, um, but we were able to do so speedily. And we were able to even change our approach in terms of how we investigated and prosecuted cases. But in addition to the um, um, giving prosecutorial powers, we also um, included tougher sentences, tougher penalties. Um, instead of having um, minimum fines, we had, instead of having maximum fines, which was in the old law, we had minimum fines in the old law. And um, although we did not, because it was unconstitutional under our laws to um, push for mandatory um, imprisonment, but yet still imposing minimum, minimum sentences at least helped make Make sure that the penalties which were imposed by the courts were much more uh, were much harsher and much uh, more challenging. In addition to all of this, we also increased the number of offences. We came, we added a number of new offences in the in the law. Um, um, offences like conflict of interest, offences like um, dealing with uh, procurement were also added to the law because for in Sierra Leone we've conducted research and data shows that. About 70% of our corruption occurs around the procurement processes. So we added a number of key and strong offenses around the, um, the whole question of procurement, procuring institutions. So I think for me, this was a huge opportunity um, and we, which we took in terms of um, um, changing the legislative and the policy um, framework within the country. The second opportunity we had was also in terms of um, building collaborative partnerships, um, building collaborative partnerships. I've already talked about the, the, the independent um, police complaints board in, the, in Sierra Leone, um, but um, there were so many other institutions. We formed what we call a National Anti-Corruption Commission Steering Committee because we realized that oversight institutions cannot and, and, and should not operate in silos, that the fight against corruption was not only the fight for the Anti-Corruption Commission, but was a fight for all uh, um, um, Sierra Leone, it was a fight for all the institutions. And so we needed to work with key stakeholders. So we formed this steering body that included people from the other um, institutions of government, but it also included civil society, it included the media, it included um, um, some of our international partners. And we tried to coordinate the fight against corruption. We tried to collaborate. And I think the, the fact that there was, a, there was the political will at the top made sure that there was a lot of interest in the particularly the the, the 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 legislature the executive for them to be able to um, be part for them to, to encourage them to show them there was the need for them to collaborate and to um, um, amplify the impact of the anti-corruption commission and other oversight institutions so that we can build public trust and can create a more conducive environment for fighting corruption then um also um i think for me uh, a key thing that was that we did within the commission was also to try to lead by example and encourage other organizations including the security sector organizations to lead by examples because i think if you want to fight corruption and then your institution is itself corrupt there's no way you can um go out there and say to others don't be corrupt and so we tried our utmost to lead by um 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 by um, running a corrupt free institution, by having clean audits, by making sure that we complied with our policies, 
and um, et cetera, et cetera. So we tried and we encouraged so many institutions to, to lead by example and to, to carry out their work. But there were so many other constraints. There were so many constraints um, in the course of the work. Um, I'll talk about um, one or two. Um, so um, the main constraint for me was the resource constraint, the, um, the limited um, human and financial um, resources that were available. I was fortunate. I had um, some um, uh, significant donor support. Uh, from a number of um, donors, but um, yet still, um, there were still significant re um, limitations in terms of the resources to ensure that we had um, effective enforcement. Um, then there was also um, the whole question of the, um, from the human resources side, you know, one of the, 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 the best ways for public servants to challenge you and to, to defeat the fight is, um, uh, you spend a lot of time training, um, I'll give for example, procurement officers, so in each institution, we try to build a cater of very good professional procurement officers that we trained, that we gave the necessary skills, that we felt had the necessary integrity. But it wasn't within our control to place um, procurement officers within the uh, various ministries. That was under the control of the Public Service Commission or the, or the um, HRMO, the Human Resources Management Office. And so many a times after spending a lot of resources training public servants, training some of these procurement officers would realize that probably after a month or two on the job, they will then be moved to um, other institutions. They'll be moved to play other roles outside of the procurement role. And then somebody else will be brought in who has basically no um, experience, no um, um, probably even um, somebody with um, some ethical background. And so um, some ethical questions um, um, to their background. And so it was a bit of a challenge um, as we tried to um, sort of build a cater across the public service um, of um, um, very strong um, fighters of, of the fight against corruption. Probably the last constraint I'll talk about, and I think I talked briefly about this when we last met in Banjul, was the challenge I had, for example, um, um, auditing the military. Um, we, I had a very good relationship with the auditor's office, the anti-corruption office, and as you would imagine, and the auditor general's office in Sierra Leone worked very closely together and we collaborated. In my case, it was helped very much that it was not only my college mate, but she was also the auditor general then was also my next door neighbor. So we had a very good rapport. We had a very good relationship and we, we worked very closely together at the time. And um, one of the things we, we tried to do was to audit the military. And I think it, it's now standard, it's now acceptable practice in Sierra Leone that the army falls within the public service and the army could be audited. But in those days, it wasn't so easy. It wasn't so um, acceptable. It wasn't so um, um, welcoming. Uh, many within the military felt that um, they should be above um, the civilian oversight, civilian review of their books, their finances, et cetera, et cetera. And it took a lot of persuasion and a lot of convincing and a lot of, um, Basically, some use of the, the a bit of a stick as well, uh, particularly since I had some political will and political support at the time to get the army to allow initially some amount of audit to the extent now where um, the the I think auditing the military is now routine. So it was a bit of a challenge, but I think it it required it required a lot of relationship building, a lot of work in terms of making sure that we were able to audit the military. So I think all of these um, um, opportunities and constraints unique in the Sierra Leone context, but I think there's things that might be similar to other contexts, but they help sort of build public awareness, they help sort of build trust. And um, although it took time, I felt that they were really, they really helped contribute to um, strengthening oversight in the, the security sector in Sierra Leone. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Abdul, for sharing. Um frankly, um, some of the opportunities you seized, um, as well as some of the constraints. Um, I think, um, as Abdul mentioned, he was with us for a, a, a subject matter experts roundtable we held this summer in the Gambia um, on related issues, security sector governance, and integration of different justice concerns into that process. We're happy to share links to our website where the conclusions um, from this experts roundtable um, were generated. We have some recommendations that we're happy to share with this group um, that, that feeds into this. Um, but thank you, Abdul, for um, sharing with us how um, over the course of time, um, you and your colleagues and your neighbors um, worked on building up some of these um, relationships of trust that, um, yeah, over time, um, have we, you know, help to create new inroads for um, audits of the security sector, which are very important also for um, 
judicious use of defense and security um, funding, um, whether within a domestic budget or whether it's revenue that's mobilized um, from external donors. And that too can also play into how the security sector builds trust with the populace. So um, we see many interconnections here that are important in terms of how the institutions in um, the security governance space might be working together effectively for, for the people. So thanks. I wanna to turn to Sean for a bit now and ask him to share a bit of his experiences as a practitioner. So Sean, let me ask you to speak for a bit um, about some successful models of police oversight and accountability institutions in different African countries. Um, what have been some successful models of this that have helped to build popular trust in state institutions and provide that security to citizens. I know we've discussed in the past um, Kenyan, South African, Nigerian models, but um, could you talk to us about some of those models that are um, uh, worthy of some comparative discussion here for seven or eight minutes? Okay. Thank you, Catherine, for the invitation and um, greetings to everyone on, on the webinar. Um, it's a difficult question, both in terms of the word model and in terms of the word success. Um, model in the sense that in a democracy, uh, civilian security or security um, institutions and agencies are accountable at multiple levels to, to multiple entities. Um, and that's the, the nature of democracy and, um, and, it, and it's appropriate that it is so. So, you know, the media is going to be asking questions, the Auditor General as Abdul mentioned, is going to be asking questions. Parliament is going to be asking questions as well. So model really, for me, is the, the, the ability of those multiple audiences to be present and to engage and the extent to which uh, they strong and robust. Do we have an independent media? Do we have a strong civil society? Uh, and then do we have these independent civilian oversight institutions like an Auditor General, uh, like a parliament and uh, like uh, specific uh, police civilian oversight institutions. Um, the, uh, the other difficult part of the question is success, um, because a lot of the institutions measure their performance based on outputs. How many cases we receive, how many cases we've resolved, um, how many prosecutions have been successful. Um, but it doesn't talk to, to issues around impact. And, and for me, there is that relationship between success and impact. I mean, are you, are you achieving the impact that you want to see through the democratization of your security institutions? Are they becoming more um, responsive to the needs of people? Are they more rights compliant? Are they working under rule of law? Are we starting to see those changes and shifts happen? And there have been several attempts to, to try and get to grips with, with, um, with impact. Um, and, and there's a lot of work still to be done there. Uh, it, it, it's not easy. So, so some people look at uh, success and impact in terms of uh, the strength of the institution. And again, this was mentioned before by Abdul, how independent is it? And I've seen other uh, comments on the chat, independence being a key criteria, resourcing, capacity being a key criteria. So, so institutionally, there's, there's been an effort to look at uh, how strong how strong the entity is and understand that in terms of how successful it is. Um, but then, as I said, there are others. I mean, is it impacting on the behavior change? Are we seeing shifts in, in the behavior change? Uh, there have been other attempts to try and look at success as in terms of accessibility. Um, uh, how accessible is it? Is it is it easy to make a complaint? Is it easy to um, engage with that entity? Is it easy to be able to receive uh, response um, from, from, that, from that entity. And then uh, I think another key success area in terms of impact is um, how strongly the whole notion of democratic oversight is accepted by the security institutions. And again, that was the example that Abdul mentioned with regard to, to the audit and the, and the role of the Auditor General. Is that level of accountability being accepted by, by our institutions? Institutions. So if we roll back a little bit and then just focus in on um, the, some of the entities that have uh, primary responsibility for police oversight uh, on the continent, and you mentioned uh, the Independent Investigative Directorate here in South Africa, the Independent Policing Oversight Authority in Kenya, the Nigerian Police Service Commission. 
I think one thing um, is that nobody, governments, and again, <laughs> I allude to the comments made by, by Abdul, government doesn't walk willingly into strengthening and building civilian police oversight. Um, they really are dragged into it. Um, and, and often it is a, an event or a series of events that necessitate the significant shift in the posture of the security establishments pre and post uh, and, and build for this provision of, of civilian oversight. Um, and, and that seems to be across. I mean, it's, you know, the, um, the Rodney King um, incident in, in LA sees the development of those civilian oversight boards. Um, and, and in Africa, I mean, we have the same. So uh, post-apartheid South Africa sees a whole reshift in thinking of security and security in the service of people and democratic control and oversight over the security establishment and the birth and the genesis of uh, an entity that will eventually become the Independent Investigative Directorate. In Kenya, we see the same shifts, post-election violence, 2007, and the need for Kenyans to rethink, you know, what, our police and, and what are they doing and how do we manage this collective security better? And, and we see seismic shifts in, in um, how policing is structured in Kenya, together with the inclusion of the um, of, of IPOA. And in Nigeria as well, post um, kind of military dictatorship and, and the democratization, the, the police service commissions coming in. Now, now, if you look at it at that, at that level, and then you start looking back at those organizations and you look at IPID in South Africa, IPOA, and, and the Police Service Commission, and against some of those key areas of, um, of, of success and impact, then, then you are starting to see um, you know, clear indications of shift and, and I would say success, um, strong legislative mandates, uh, resourcing, resourcing is never enough, um, and I think it is uh, certainly an area where most of these entities remain hamstrung, um, but certainly a nod towards resourcing and, and a building of capacity and a building of understanding of, of oversight and, and the role of oversight. Um, and I think maybe just, you know, to end off on this as well, is that the, the other... It is a dynamic environment. And so you see big entities where there's been a considerable investment of resource and political capital in, in their establishment and their maintenance. Um, but but the, the dynamism of, of this environment is that there are other opportunities for um, promoting civilian oversight. And I'm thinking here, um, and then just back on, on the South African example, it's recent ratification of OPCAT and the establishment of a national preventive mechanism. And this bringing in a whole new um, set of actors looking at specifically issues of detention and custody. And, and here, including our, our military ombud, uh, which, which hasn't had that direct a role in terms of the, um, the oversight of uh, military detention and, um, and, and those facilities, but bring them in under the, the mandate of the UN CAT uh, and look at, um, at conditions of, of detention um, in, in those military establishments. And so, so again, you see, you know, significant changes. And, and, and I think maybe the final point here is that in, in this road of, of, of democratization, um, these, these opportunities and successes present themselves and, and we build on that to, to create those multiple points of, of oversight and accountability. Thank you so much, Sean. Um, thank you for, um, yes, I think um, reaffirming what um, Abdul had also been underscoring about different political um, opportunities, different opportunities um, uh, emerge uh, over the course of a uh, uh, trajectory, over the course of, you know, the process of governing. Um, and so looking out for those opportunities. Um, sometimes they're also forcing mechanisms, as you mentioned, in terms of how some of these institutions or, or practices get built. Um, and I think um, you had spoken a bit about parliament and also about civil society. 
um, as has Abdul. So I think it's worth asking you a follow-up question here about exactly that. Um, so could you speak a bit about the roles that civil society and parliaments can play in reinforcing police accountability? Um, and feel free to talk about um, whichever context you've worked in make the most sense. Um, but we're curious, especially given the work of the African Policing Civilian Oversight Forum, um, you know, how has APCOF used um, different tools and techniques in its own work um, to, to enhance civilian oversight in this way through these channels? No, thanks, Catherine. So, I mean, again, we, we understand and approach the civilian oversight um, on a three-tiered basis uh, with the um, external civilian oversight entities like your IPIDs and IPOAs uh, and OMBUDS um, as, as one uh, sphere. Um, obviously, the internal uh, mechanisms, the internal affairs units, um, disciplinary procedures and boards within the entities, um, and then very critically, civil society as, as an integral third party to, to this uh, tripod. And, and certainly, you know, that tripod is, is indicative of a robust system of oversight. If one of the legs are missing, it is unstable. Um, and so you need to see civil society as a critical leg to that robust system of, of oversight. Um, and and their, their, their role is, is multiple because they are so diverse as well. But I think key for me is that, one is that this is where your complaints and issues are generated. Um, so it, it, is, it is the mechanism that feeds the work and activity of, of the, of the um, civilian oversight entity. Um, and secondly, it is also the mechanism that is able to relay the successes of that entity back into the community and be able to then affirm and confirm the changes and the impacts that it's having and the way in which uh, democracy and a consequence for behavior is, is, is being managed. Um, and and this, is, this is absolutely critical. Otherwise, you know, how do you get, how do you get the word out? How do you get people to know that uh, you are achieving uh, and you are busy building democracy. So those roles of civil society are just built into the into the whole system of, of oversight. And then they also, in, in the broadest sense of civil society, this is the key space of sustainability um, because you are going to get pushback on a number of these areas. This mechanism is too expensive. Perhaps we can collapse it into something else. No, we don't have money this year. We're going to kind of cut down on your budget or you're getting a little bit too uh, close. <laughs> so maybe we're going to kind of cut the wings somewhere. And, there, and there's always this kind of to and fro. Um, but with a, a literate civil society on principles of democracy and uh, the importance of, of oversight and accountability, um, this is the, the space where the entity is sustained. And this is the space where that entity is grown and supported and built up so that when we look back over 10 years, we can look back on achievement. Um, and without that, um, we, we, without that ability of civil society to champion the cause, um, you're, not going to, you're not going to be able to achieve that. And then obviously there are kind of clear role. So the ability of, of the various entities of civil society to bring things to attention, uh, the opportunities around whistleblowing, um, the uh, research and um, the uh, importance of evidence-based advocacy are all roles that civil society play and does play in, in being able to um, take the, the project forward. Um, and, and likewise with Parliament, I mean, it is a key uh, component of that system of external civilian oversight, and it, and it has a dual role, uh, which is really important. Um, and that dual role is that it has a, both a proactive component as well as a reactive component, and, and oversight really recognizes the importance of both of those um, um, spaces. So on the proactive side, it's parliament that is making the laws. It's parliament that is um, reviewing the plans and, and um, expropriating the, the, the budgets. And, and, but it's also the parliament that is um, holding the entity itself to account, but is also raising concerns uh, amongst the institutions that it 
mon the security institutions that it's also responsible for behavior, um, um, kind of allegations of corruption, um, and the performance of civilian oversight to, to be able to tackle and achieve that. And I think that, that that ability of both being proactive in a very powerful way and, and that reactive compliance monitoring is, um, is, is, is unique to, to Parliament. Um, so, I mean, we're a small organization and we've been, we've been working um, in, in three areas where we believe that uh, we can and across that broad environment of um, internal, external and, and, and civilian. And, and this is around uh, knowledge building, um, advocacy and where we can, um, any technical assistance that we, we can provide. And we do it across all the spaces where we feel that there might be leverage, traction, um, sympathy for the, the democracy project and, and oversight. And, and it's been critical. So knowledge building, uh, we've been running a very successful course on police oversight and accountability with the University of Pretoria, um, which your alumni are welcome to as well, if I could do a bit of advertising. <laughs> And um, but certainly knowledge building is a key component. And and the, and what we've been able to do is because we also on the uh, on, on the coal face of um, the development of these institutions and the issues and the and the research around them, uh, we are able to bring new um, new debate into this process on an ongoing basis. Um, so that's that's been that's been very useful. We've also in in the kind of broadly around this is um, literacy is, is incredibly important and it speaks back into uh, the sustainability of the democracy project within the, the populace, uh, the acceptance of oversight and accountability within the security institution. So we do a lot of work just literacy building, demystifying and, and building up those institutions. And then um, proactively, a, a lot of work on standard setting so taking um, agreed treaties uh, and, and conventions that uh, have been adopted and accepted uh, by the African Union uh, and its sister organs and to understand them in terms of policing and what does that mean if, with application. So standards at the level of the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, uh, model laws at the, at the level of the Pan-African Parliament and, and currently cooperating with the um, um, SSR DDR division at the at the AU Council around the the security sector framework and what accountability and how accountability should be postured within that security sector framework, and then technically um, as per as per the organisations and as they require. Um, very briefly, then uh, national human rights institutions carry a huge weight when it comes to police oversight. Often we find that a lot of the personnel do not have investigation experience. They come from a legal background. They come from a social research background. So basic 101 on investigation skills was, was very useful for a lot of the NHRIs that we worked with. Um, caseload and caseload management. We are on a project with uh, IPID at the moment looking at case prioritization in ways in which we can uh, approach the caseload a lot more smartly. We're also supporting them with an impact assessment uh, to understand better the, the impact that they're having. Um, and, and with other role players as well, we worked uh, a while back with the South African Parliamentary Committee on Police to, to look at uh, a more systemized way of, of doing their oversight visits to police stations and building up checklists around that and being able to take it forward. Thank you, Sean, for such a wide range of examples um, of uh, the work that's being done. Um, I think um, now I would like to turn to both of our speakers. Um, I'll go to Abdul first and then to Sean. And to round out our moderated discussion, I have the same question for both of you. You know, many people in our audience, there are people from parliament, from civil society, um, a few from some of these oversight institutions themselves. Um, I know um, you know, APCOF um, and Abdul, your own networks, you've invited people to this webinar as well, but we also have a, a large core of Africa Center alumni who are themselves in the defense and security sectors who are listening in. So I, I, want, I want to ask a question about um, them 
Um, how can professionals in the security sector help to build institutions or make individual contributions that could um, contribute to building a reliable system of civilian oversight that could be effective both for the security sector and um, for the citizens in their country. So if you have advice for our alumni who are um, on that, uh, in those places um, within, within their careers, um, what would you say to them? Um, so Abdul, um, we'll go to you first in terms of how security sector actors can contribute here. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Um, apologies, I, I understand that the first time I spoke, uh, I was going super fast. So I'm gonna try to be a little slower this time. <laughs> I used to have this problem of speaking very fast when I was in court, so I'll try to be much slower now. But I, I think um, I want to draw again, going back to my Sierra Leone experience and my own first-hand experience and um, probably um, uh, um, name two individuals or two people who I want to use as an example of how they, they supported um, uh, the fight against um, corruption. Um, um, within the Sierra Leone context. Um, one is a, the current national security advisor now in government. Um, I think he's brigadier, uh, he's a brigadier now. I, uh, apologies if I miss his title, but um, I had an excellent relationship with Kelly Conte, um, Brigadier Kelly Conte. Um, he's done significant work, not only in Sierra Leone, but in the continent as well, as well recently in the Gambia. And I know in um, South Sudan, he's done incredible work. I want to cite the sort of relationship I had with him and also mention um, the relationship I had and the way I worked with the um, then Minister of Defense. He, I think he's Major Paolo, Paolo Conte. Paolo was the Minister of Defense at the time when I served as the Anti-Corruption Commission. But just to use them as an example, which maybe others may um, look to one, I think for both of them, first of all, being in crucial and uh, important roles, um, when I engaged them and when I met with them, Paolo, Paolo Conte, is, apart from being a soldier, uh, was a soldier, he's retired now, apart from being a soldier then, um, was also a lawyer. And so um, when I engaged both Paolo and Kelly separately then, I think the key thing I asked for and the key thing that they gave to me was, first of all, to embrace the fight against corruption. Both of them agreed and committed themselves to embracing to embrace the fight against corruption. So I think for leaders um, who are in the security sector, I think it is important that um, they remain committed, not just in terms of the, the rhetoric, but also with their action to um, um, support the fight against corruption and ensure that the, the, um, the institution um, is fully engaged in the fight against corruption. So with um, uh, the defense minister, one of the first things he said to me when I met him was to say, can you make copies of the new anti-corruption laws for me? So he took a copy for himself. He provided me with an opportunity to sit with him and take him through the law. But then he also asked for copies, which he then distributed to the senior officers within the army. And in addition to that, working with Kelly Conte as well, we organized a number of trainings. So I was frequently at Wilberforce, um, the military um, um, barracks there and the, the senior officers master there, um, talking to the senior officers, talking to not just the senior, but the middle level officers as well, talking to them about the Anti-Corruption Act, talking to them about the rule, their rule, helping to train them about the act and the law itself what the law what the law provides and what the law entails so i think providing leadership providing embracing the fight supporting the fight and in a few instances um where i really really commended both of them is that they not only left me with the senior officers in some instances they actually attended the trainings themselves to show their commitment to show their support and to show their engagement so i felt that was really crucial and that was really 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 um important and that really helped me in terms of strengthening my hand in um, um, pushing the fight against corruption within um, um, the the the, the, mili the military um, at the time. Um, so I think encouraging transparency within their ranks and ensuring that they 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 as I say lead by example. They live by their example. So they tried. I mean, I, well, there was nobody more meticulous than. Um, um, the defense minister then in terms of following the procurement processes, he he would read the procurement processes and wherever he had doubts, he would send to the ACC and to the procurement uh, um, a body to send him somebody to help him guide him through the processes. So there was a sense that there was um, um, 
senior level um, support, senior level engagement, and senior level buying into the process. And I think that really um, um, helped push um, transparency. But then there's also the need, if you are in um, the security sector now and you're, you're in any of these oversight bodies, I think it's really important that you um, encourage transparency across the board. So it's not just waiting until there are cases of corruption, but you'll be transparent in your uh, um, publishing your budget, publishing, making public, um, particularly those aspects where, where there are no security concerns or there are no security issues. It's about being open and transparent. I think that for me is key and that's um, important. But it's also um, supporting oversight institutions. It didn't happen with both Kelly and with um, um, Paolo Conte, but um, we had, um, there was a unique minister of finance in Sierra Leone who, a deputy minister of finance at the time, he later became a, min a minister of finance, but who really supported the fight against corruption when I was president by regularly referring any suspicious cases he found or he saw within the system to the anti-corruption commission for further investigation. Some people said he didn't want to pay, he didn't want to make payment, he was using it as a delay tactics, etc. But I was happy that somebody within government, somebody within a public sector institution was not waiting for us to go and find out or for us to go and dig for information, but was actually sending cases to us and say, you help me look into this, you help me investigate this, you help me inquire into this, and you help me um, ensure that um, what we're doing here is um, corrupt free. So I felt that was really, really, really important and that was really key. Also, I think, um, so I think for many of the leaders who are present on the call, you can support oversight institutions by collaborating with them, by cooperating with them, by providing them with the necessary information, by supporting their inquiries, supporting their investigation, or supporting their preventative measures. I, I am a big fan of, of prevention. I don't mind pro investigating and prosecuting, as uh, I'm sure if uh, Sierra Leoneans on the call will tell you, I was bold enough to prosecute um, a number of gov sitting government ministers. But I think prevention is really key in the fight against corruption. And I think we can prevent corruption um, um, and not wait until um, the acts have been committed or been done before we prosecute and then start trying to recover the money. So there are lots of ways we can prevent corruption. So I'm a big fan of preventing corruption. And one of the key things that we did do in the Anti-Corruption Commission um, in Sierra Leone, we didn't do it with the military or the police, were what we call system reviews, going into institutions and reviewing their systems to make sure that we identify potential areas of corruption and try to close those gaps. That's a key preventative measure for me. And that's a key area where I think if you're committed to the fight against corruption, you can support oversight bodies by welcoming them, embracing them, in fact, inviting them to come to the um, um, commission to um, um, take a look into your systems and advise you in terms of the reforms that you had with the military, with the um, immigration department in Sierra Leone in particular, we had um, different, we had various codes that we, 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 for immigration, it was much clearer. We came up with a system whereby we, we agreed with them that we needed to inform the public about their systems, let people know exactly what it entails to get a passport in Sierra Leone. There was so much, there's still so much corruption in, the, in acquiring a passport in Sierra Leone. And very few people didn't know what the process was to acquire a passport, how long it will take. And it, was, it left a lot of room for um, corruption. So um, we engaged them and we were able to make sure that they, we agreed on a system whereby we publicized on the radio at the cost of the commission to let people know that if you submit your passport forms within X number of days, you should expect a response. This is the fee you pay, this is the amount you pay, et cetera. So I think having that kind of collaboration, having that kind of a code that's made public, I think really goes a long way. And it, it, it requires the support of not just the Anti-Corruption Commission, but it requires the support also of the heads of these various institutions to be able to do um, put out such a message and send out a message, such a message that will um, encourage and, and, and uh, build public trust and confidence. Um, also, I think um, to advocate for institutional reforms, I, I think I, uh, I've mentioned that. I think that's key to make sure that the institutions themselves reform themselves and align to the um, objectives of the various, uh, the Human Rights Commission, et cetera, or the Anti-Corruption Commission. I think that's good. I think also promoting training and education. I think that's really good if you can encourage your officers to be able to um, 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 uh, promote training and education of human rights 
training of um, um, on anti-corruption issues so that I, um, it will really go for the for military officers. This is wonderful. This is even great because if you're trying to avoid command responsibility, then make sure you give your soldiers, give, give those within your command the necessary training, the requisite training so that you can instill a culture of compliance and respect for um, the rule of law and the various rules of international humanitarian law. And so I think that's really key. And I think for me, um, if you're on the call and you're doing this, uh, you, are, you are heading a security institution, you can, um, these are some of the measures I think you can take cooperating with independent institutions, being more transparent and um, leading by example in terms of respecting human rights and um, the rule of law. I mean, you can even go a step further and speak out against corruption and mis misconduct within the sector um, and support um, colleagues who are trying to um, reform the security sector. But it's really important to work together and to work to support the mission of the, the commissions, um, the, the, the independent commissions, not just in terms of rhetoric, but in terms of your individual action as well. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Um, and I was just looking at the chat. This is a fun fact for all the ACSS alumni who are listening. Um, our The founding director of the Africa Center um, is here online and she says, um, ACSS continuity is in play here. Kelly Conte was one of the two Sierra Leonean participants at the very first program the Africa Center ever put on in Dakar in 1999. So. Kelly is a superstar. Oh, no. he's, he's a, he's a, he's a, yes. He was one of those who really helped me <laughs> do my work quite well. <laughs> yes. Okay, Sean, um, please take a few minutes to bring us home on your answer to this question. And then please, everybody, we will move into question and answer. So you should be typing in any questions you have for the speakers into the chat in, in whichever language you prefer. Sean, over to you. Yes, it's, um, it's really where those professionals are located. Um, and that the roles that they can play. And I think um, key is, is leadership. Um, any security institution uh, wants to be seen as an institution with integrity, trusted, respected. And an oversight is one of those mechanisms that confirm your compliance and your adherence to, to rule of law and, and rights compliant behavior. And so leadership is well positioned to recognize that and use that mechanism because it serves in the end their own purpose in building that respect for, for their entity, for the uniform and for the work that they're doing. Um, one of the most kind of satisfying projects that, that we were involved with was to work with the East African police commissioners who, who recognized the importance of the application and domestication of the African Charter and the international standards around policing and uh, translated that into a, a common standard of policing for Eastern Africa and have worked on it ever since to deepen its understanding and, and, and its application. And, and that is indicative of the kind of leadership that you're looking for, um, is to keep that issue on the agenda, to support it, to promote it, to take it forward in new and exciting ways. Um, I said, you know, it depends on where where the professionals are located because it, it is a very dynamic and um, and developing uh, environment, which is, I guess, why I've been busy with it for so long because it remains new and exciting. But um, you, you know, the, the the customer base for 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 oversights, uh, the people that use this. Um, either victimized or um, felt rights have been violated. It's not a homogenous group of people. And, and we, we often blind to say, we provide oversight to the people, but the way in which the people are able to access and use and appreciate those services is very different depending on where you are. Um, and, and your own unique situations. So you might be LGBTIQ. Um, a woman's experience is very different to a man's experience when it comes to accessing even the oversight and complaints mechanisms. Um, and, and what we've been busy with recently is um, migrants and non-nationals and, and their extent um, to, to access these services which should be available to them. Um, uh, in the country and as services to, to a democracy. So for, for um, security uh, professionals to, to understand 
um, and to and to know what works and what doesn't work and the challenges and to be able to design and input into systems that are more responsive is, is, a, is an incredibly important uh, contribution. And then generally to, to um, acknowledge and voice the support for, for democracy um, and, and, the, and the institutions of democracy. We, as I said, we were doing this impact assessment for, for IPID here in South Africa, and we, we've got some of the results and we're busy looking at some of those results. But one that has really struck me is after having dreading um, the thought of having a blanket antagonism and um, adversary by South African police service members towards the IPID, um, because this has been a survey of, of SAP's members on, on their experiences with, with civilian oversight. In fact, um, it's actually the opposite. There is a, a significant level of appreciation and acknowledgement and support for accountability and civilian oversight. And it's it's those members that actually need to stand up and say, no, you know, this is this is right, it's proper, it's appropriate, it, it's it's what we need to professionalize our service. Thanks. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you um, to both Abdul and to Sean um, for all of the insights you've provided through this moderated exchange. Um, I am certain it's been uh, interesting and very helpful um, for those who are listening, but those who are listening, um, we know you also have expertise and experiences um, and knowledge to share on this. So we've been monitoring the chat. I encourage you all to continue typing your questions into the chat because we're collecting them. And we have about 20 minutes for um, some question and answer with our two panelists. So I'll do my best to cover as many of these as I can, but there are so many questions that I encourage people to stay for our open discussion hour, um, which will begin after the 20 minutes of Q&A that we do here, because we'll have much more time to unpack um, uh, some of what people are bringing up on the chat. Um, so let me propose that Abdul and Sean, I will um, take three questions at a time, um, and I will, um, you know, uh, read them out to you all, and then maybe we can give each of you um, a few minutes to respond, and we'll try to do maybe uh, two or three rounds, depending on how complicated <laughs> the answers to these questions may be. Um, so one, um, here's here's a question for you both. Um, one of our pan, one of our listeners says both speakers wonderfully addressed the top levels of corruption and the need for civilian oversight and the need for political will to drive change. However, how do you tie this to the need to change society's acceptance of corruption that sometimes permeates other aspects of society, often referred to as good corruption that's necessary to get day-to-day -day things done? Um, so that's one question. We have another. Um, about military coups. Um, military coups come with no oversight. Examples can be made of Mali and Burkina Faso, says this listener. So in coup situations, there is no oversight and the military junta gets to do whatever they want. My question is, what measures can be put in place to ensure retrospective oversight and accountability once the military leaves power. Um, can oversight be ensured in military juntas or in transitions? Um, je vais dire en français parce que j'ai vu aussi uh, par plusieurs commentaires. I'm going to say it in French because I saw a few comments in the chat. There, there is a, some time to, there are some people who say that there are some um attempts being made and i'm going to ask you a third question it's a question that was raised in french the participant says hello to all how did you manage to convince the government to adopt the commission 
and the ability, the control to pursue in factors. Uh, so the policies, how did you create these policies within these institutions? So we'll stop there. We have three questions. Um, one about um, cor corruption. Is there a good kind of corruption? What does one do with that um, in these discussions of oversight um, and accountability generally, of oversight and accountability of the security sector um, more specifically? That's the first question. I imagine, Abdul, you will have some things to say about that. Um, we had the question about juntas and oversight and accountability um, during or after transitions away from um, military rule um, in light of recent coups. Um, I imagine both of you will have things to say about that. And then this question um, about how, how um, do you convince the government um, to provide certain powers that can you know, help independent oversight commissions, whether a police or anti-corruption commissions, human rights commissions to do their work. Um, let's start this round. Um, we'll start with um, Sean, and then we'll go to Abdul. Sorry, Mike. Um, corruption, um, very important not to conflate the two. You're dealing with corruption by security officers, a particular mandate, they've got a particular responsibility, you need to address and root out that corruption. Separately, you will need a civil literacy project around the importance of ethical behavior and the importance of your behavior vis-a-vis -vis the ethics of the institution. Um, Post-coup, it presents one of the greatest opportunities to start building in these mechanisms of uh, democracy and, and civilian oversight. And this is where we've seen South Africa as an example, Nigeria post-coup as an example, where these opportunities present themselves. Um, how do you convince? Again, it's it's with extreme difficulty. Uh, governments are notoriously reluctant to to make these moves and are often dragged in it because they don't have any other um, option. But you know the importance of tenacity, sustained advocacy, the evidence around that, and building on those pressure points is absolutely key. Um, I saw one of your colleagues also posted a question around uh, decentralized versus centralized police services and oversight over such systems. Look, it is possible, but uh, decentralized systems obviously uh, offer you a lot more complexity and it's a lot more difficult to um, provide for, certainly at a national level, the, the kind of intrusive oversight that you're looking for uh, under these mechanisms. Thanks. Abdul. Thanks, Catherine. And um, before I completely forget, um, uh, I don't think um, we should conclude this session by not congratulating Sean for the great victory of the South African Springboks and making Africa proud. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we just, I'm just hoping that my favorite sports, the Proteas, win the Cricket World Cup, and then I'll be very happy. But um, on the um, specific question, the first question on um, the... Um, uh, civilian acceptance of um, corruption, it's a huge challenge. I mean, corruption is itself very, it's a very complex uh, problem and there are no easy solutions to it. But, you know, I, I, I joked in Sierra Leone that I, Sierra Leoneans were supportive of my fight against corruption until it got close closer to home until it touched them until it affected them i remember one of the um one of my best supporters a journalist in sierra leone who praised my appointment um became my number one critic the moment i arrested somebody that was closely um that was close to to, uh, to her and so i think um um people perception people's viewpoint about corruption changes it it um um, um it changes depending on how we, you're fighting on who you touch. And Sierra Leone is such a small country and it's such a small context that um, it's very easy for you to um, be criticized or for you to um, be seen as not doing the right thing because if you're going closer to a family member or you're going closer to um, somebody within their community or somebody who supports um, them, they will always tend to see you as the as the rival. They always want the corruption, the fight against corruption to be seen far away. I don't think there's anything as good corruption and I think for me, um, um, corruption is negative. The senses I've engaged with and the senses that it has in Sierra Leone, and I think it's negative. And I think a key part that we need to do in institutions fighting corruption is really to 
educate to the public. I think education and awareness is from, in my view, really, really key in making sure that the public understands the consequences, the dangers of corruption. One of the things we did in the Sierra Leone context was to publish infographics. So we, because in just saying that corruption is harmful, I don't think a lot of people got the message. But when we started by saying that if the number of duty-free waivers that are giving at customs were not given, we would have been able to build 20 or 30 hospitals. Then I think such messages resonate with people. People begin to see the direct impact of um, 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 the cost and the impact and the effect of um, um, the, 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 the loss they're getting as a result of the fight against corruption. And beginning also to show people that the little gain they may get or profit they may make from corruption, the national loss is much higher and has greater consequence. I think um, that would probably send a message and I think that's the kind of message. So I think it's really important that the, um, there's a overall cultural change that uh, the efforts are made to really promote honesty and integrity within the society and to promote ethical behavior and um, stigmatize um, corruption. On the um, question about, um, I think I fully 100% agree with Sean that um, you don't get government willingly supporting this. You don't get government agreeing fully on this. Um, the um, President Koroma, when he appointed me um, to the Anti-Corruption Commission, um, I don't believe that it was sort of a willing effort. I think he realized that he had won on an anti-corruption mandate. I think he realized that he needed to do something about the fight against corruption. And I think at the time he wanted to do something about it, but it wasn't just a willingness. The criticism, the, the, the music, the, the populist viewpoint at the time was that there was a need to do something about it. And I think politicians will always listen to the public mood and will always tend to go and flow by the, with the public mood. And I think that was the sense, that was what tied their, um, their hands at the time to say, okay, let's get somebody who can do the, who can lead the fight against corruption. So I think we need to continue to drag them. We need to continue to push them. We need to continue to ensure that we get them um, um, to do the right thing because it's not something they will do willingly. And it has, we have to continuously push them. Fully also agree again that post-transition, post-military um, um, coups, um, that's the time you need um, to really put in place to rebuild institutions. Institutional reforms is um, transitional justice and the whole question of what happens post the military is not just about do conducting truth commissions and about um, prosecuting people, but it's also about rebuilding those institutions. I think we've seen how, for example, in Kenya, Kenya was able to successfully build um, its justice sector and create a, a judiciary that um, is still, by and large, in my opinion, um, standing the test of time and is being able to fight back and push against um, 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 some of the excesses of the executive. So I think for me, really post post um, um, coup, post conflict, I think that's a really ideal time to ensure that some of these key institutions that led to the coup in the first place, some of these key institutions that gave the military the excuse to intervene in the first place, they are rebuilt, they are strengthened, they are put in place, and are made sure that and are made sure that they can deliver on the mandates that they're supposed to deliver on. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for another round. I'll pose the first question in French. There was a question from one of our uh, uh, Africa Center alumni. The question is, how do we, how do we uh, do a control of our security forces fighting against terrorists and um, destabilizing or, uh, forces in a country like Mali? How do we uh, provide that kind of oversight? The second question um, that I see um, in our list here, um, someone from Nigeria, speaking from the Nigerian experience where lack of synergy between various organs of the security architecture made it possible for insecurity to fester, um, they say, 
For example, the security forces are not sharing intelligence with the Army or the Navy or vice versa. So between different branches of the services, how can we bolster more positive relationships between those entities? Along similar lines, there's some interest from our military colleagues. Um, having heard the discussions of police oversight, are there any different or similar challenges in civilian oversight of the military by the police? Um, so I think um, that's plenty of fodder for the next eight minutes for the two of you. Um, maybe this time, Abdul, are you all right if I start with you on those questions and then we'll move to Sean. It's okay to start with me. I was also going to get myself into trouble by answering another question that you um, haven't mentioned, the one about um, appointment by the president and um, the um, how that, uh, who appoints, somebody asked the question about who appoints the, the anti-corruption commissioner. And, yes, please go uh, ahead. Any question you see, you can address, yes. I can read between the lines that the whole question about um, appointing the head of the anti-corruption. I was also, um, before I answer that question, just to also agree fully with Solomon. Um, I don't um, I know, but I suspect Solomon is a countryman. Um, I, I didn't see the son name, but um, Solomon fully agree with you about state capture and the challenges that state capture poses. And I think uh, I've written a bit about the dominant executives that we have within Africa, and I think that's a huge challenge. Um, we need to curb executive powers, and I think one of the biggest challenges we face in Sierra Leone today is this whole notion of, um, that was sort of advanced by the Supreme Court on what they call supreme executive power, but that's a debate for another day. Um, on the question of the president's appointing, I think it's really crucial to say that um, when we were working on the new Anti-Corruption Act, we tried to take that power away from the president. Unfortunately, it was non-negotiable, and um, as you know, when you're passing a law, you, it, there needs to be a bit of bargaining and negotiation. There were two things that we bargaining, bargained on that we um, didn't um, successfully get. Um, one, the appointment of the commissioner being much more independent and being much more neutral. And then secondly, the whole question about asset declarations being made public. We didn't get both but we got a lot more, which I thought we were really helped and strengthened the commission. We got prosecutorial powers and we got a number of things. So I think the president appointing the, 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 the anti-corruption commissioner, while it is not the most desirable, I think it is one of the biggest challenges we face within the, 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 our country and our respective countries, that it's not something that they're willing to give. It's not something that they're willing to give up to. And I, and I understand the perception that if the president appoints you, then you're going to be loyal to them. You're not going to be aggressive in investigating um, corruption within the president's own government. I hope I proved the contrary, and I hope I showed the contrary in Sierra Leone that that's not necessarily always the case, because the I, I, I think probably the most sustained attack I got in Sierra Leone was from the president's government and the president's cabinet, who felt that I should have concentrated on the past and the previous government rather than focused on the current government. Whereas my view is I would look at both the past and the present. And um, I felt that um, the present was also as important as, as, as the past. But I think giving the commission a clear mandate, giving the commission its own powers to investigate, giving the commission its own powers to prosecute, I think for me, those are ways you can mitigate the, um, um, the, the, um, the, challenge. Those are ways that you can mitigate the risk of the president um, capturing the commission or the president um, taking over. I think if the commission has a clear mandate and the commission also just not just reports to the president. You know, the checks and balances that's not working in Sierra Leone is that the commissioner, and not just the commissioner, but for all appointments, parliament is supposed to be the, that check. Sadly, parliament, unfortunately, is not so much of a check because almost 90%, I think 99% of um, presidential appointments go through the parliamentary appointments committee and are approved by parliament, which should not be the case because I, parliament should have been and ought to have been the check to push back um, um, on the, um, the um, um, presidential appointment where in instances they do not meet the requirements or they face the, the challenge. Okay, so I straight now I've forgotten your questions you asked, but <laughs> I think there was one. <laughs> there was a question about Mali, um, question about the, Mali. the fight against terrorism. There was a question about um, how to improve information sharing for oversight across different branches of the armed forces, and are the challenges for police oversight different for the from the challenges to? You yeah, know. I'll leave the last one to Sean for police and military oversight, but on the question of. Um, 
on an ongoing conflict, that is a very challenging task. Um, when there's a conflict um, to uh, improve oversight in an ongoing conflict, I think that's really, really, really um, difficult. And that's really important, um, um, a challenging task to do. In many instances, I recall during the war in Sierra Leone, there were lots of um, uh, um, exceptions. There were lots of instances where by um, the government or the security forces would rely on the um, national security defense, the national security. Um, this has been done in the interest of national security action. And I think in the context of a war, many a times um, um, militaries and governments will do so. But having said that, I think it's important to have very clear and transparent rules of engagement for security forces, even during um, um, conflict. I think um, particularly ensuring the compliance of um, human rights principles and international humanitarian law, I think these are key principles which the um, need to be part of those rules of engagement and which the soldiers need to know that um, th these are non-negotiable. I mean, um, the um, setting up of the International Criminal Court and the fact that we're now very clear in terms of um, what can be amnestied and what cannot be amnestied, I think for me is very, uh, uh, um, should be a proper, should be messages which should be part of those rules of engagement, messages which should be um, spread to the military to, to say, even in the course of conflict, there are rules you have to abide by, there are rules you have to keep to, there are rules you have to comply with. And these rules are non-negotiable. If you violate them, there are consequences and you will be held accountable for them, either in the ICC or in regional or, 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 or national um, tribunals. I also think it's important during the, um, even during conflict for civil society organizations to continue to work to promote accountability in the security sector. Um, part of my role when I was in um, the, the Sierra Leone and when I headed campaign for good governance was to monitor the security forces during the conflict in Sierra Leone. And um, I wrote a piece about human rights atrocities committed by the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council, the AFRC, um, long years back based on the monitoring work that I, I conducted and I and, and uh, uh, with CGG. And um, we did a lot of work bringing to uh, public attention to um, the atrocities that were being committed. So I think civil society organizations can play a key role even during conflict to monitor. And you can also partner because in, in our case in Sierra Leone, we didn't have the voice to reach the global level. And we partnered with the um, with Human Rights Watch then. Um, I worked closely with Corinne Dufka uh, in ensuring that those atrocities were brought to the international level in Human Rights Watch's report, so mm -hmm. as to ensure that they gain global attention. And um, as a result, um, um, help sort of promote accountability within the sector during the conflict. So I think there are things you can still do even within um, the course of conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Sean. We'll give you um, the last word here on the Q&A uh, before some final announcements for the open discussion. Okay, so just a couple things. Um, so the war on terror and um, the security institutions and oversight and accountability um, is, is a very complex environment and uh, anti-terror legislation has certainly muddied it and has taken us back um, decades in terms of, of the rights agenda. And, and what it's done for civilian oversight institutions is that a lot of these have been established with clear mandates on policing, for example. And so the actions of the military fall outside of the mandate of those civilian oversight institutions. And the, the attention to dedicated civilian oversight institutions for the military is not as developed um, because of the, of, of the role that they're playing. So it is a, it's an incredibly complicated area, um, but there is a lot of effort and work being put into that. And so one thing perhaps to mention is the, the latest set of guidelines by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, which are uh, adhering and upholding human rights in the declaration of states of emergency and disaster. So it looks at those exceptional situations and circumstances and a, 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 discusses that against the, the rights obligations. Um, if, we, if we then maybe move into that other question on the differences between police and military oversight, then, I mean, the key difference is between international um, human rights law and uh, humanitarian law. And, and it really rests on uh, the deployment. And 
Ideally, you don't want to see military deployed domestically. Um, you want them deployed for purpose, um, um, and and that they will then fall under humanitarian law with with the with the um, with the oversights that that are applicable there. Um, synergy, um, again, as I said, there is um, it, it, it's it's wrong to think of oversight as a singular point of reference. Uh, that there is this multiplicity of audiences to whom the security institutions are accountable to. And there are within that arena entities that can very directly and definitely ask questions around the lack of synergy and cooperation between entities. And here I think Parliament, particularly if you have a single parliamentary committee, which is like a home affairs or an internal affairs or a security parliamentary committee, uh, that speaks both to military and police. They can certainly ask those questions and demand answers for that. Um, there are just two other questions that I saw on the chat that I quickly want to talk to. Uh, public expenditure and whether that is um, a terrain for oversight. Absolutely. Again, it's the, you know, your, your budget and your expenditure is as much uh, subject to scrutiny and oversight as, as your behavior is and certainly that should be a, an, an arena and then uh, the extent to which anti-corruption efforts feature within uh, an ssr agenda um certainly at the at the front end i can think of two uh very importantly the whole vetting process um would be uh key in terms of um addressing some of the corruption that comes around with appointments and um i think codes of conduct is another area that is really important where you actually can bring in to that um, uh, um, uh, kind of understanding of your ethics and integrity, the importance of uh, adopting an, an anti-corruption stance. But those are just off the cuff, two of the first, first kind of entry points that I would engage with. Thank you. And thanks to both Sean and Abdul for themselves monitoring the, the chat as well and finding um, some of the other questions that you were easily able to address for um, our alumni.